Welcome to the ProAdvisor Marketing Podcast, where creatives and nerds collide. Designed for today's bookkeepers, accountants, and tax pros, we are dedicated to helping you learn how to market your firm as we discuss the latest marketing strategies that are working right now. Whether you're just starting your firm or looking to maximize your marketing efforts, this podcast is for you, packed with insights on how firms can grow their brand and online presence. This podcast is hosted by Kristen Corey, a marketing expert in the accounting space and founder of ProAdvisor Marketing, and Eric Caceres, who co-founded a successful CPA firm and now helps others build the firm of their dreams through his company, ProAdvisor Brands. Please welcome your hosts, Kristen and Eric. Welcome to episode 18 of the ProAdvisor Marketing Podcast. I'm Kristen Corey. And I'm Eric Caceres. And today we are going over how accountants are growing their Facebook groups. We have talked a lot lately about how Facebook groups are the new and improved Facebook page, but it's not enough to just create a group. You need to actually grow it in order to get a good ROI. I want to take a quick minute to tell you about our new Facebook group, The Meeting Room. We are constantly looking for new ways to connect with you and add value. So this group is designed for accountants, bookkeepers, and tax professionals who want to grow their business. We talk tech, marketing systems, processes, anything and everything that can help you grow your business. So if you want to join, be sure to check out our resources where it'll be linked. Okay, so welcome back to another episode of the ProAdvisor Marketing Podcast. We are up and running this week, uh, depending on when you're hearing it. The week of February 15th, 2021 was an interesting one for all of us Texans. Uh, If you remember, Texas got a big storm that took out one thing after another. Um, I am based in San Antonio, and if you are from the northern northern U.S., you were probably very confused by the uh, couple inches of snow that took out uh, a lot of Texas. Um, <laughs> but uh, but we're back, and uh, I don't know. It was it was it was a crazy week, and I'm just happy that everything's back to normal, and I'm back in uh, kind of my normal routine. Um, so, yeah, how are how are kind of the news uh, on your end, Eric? Were people <laughs> Did you hear about it too much? Because it was, I mean, it was obviously all we were talking about down here. Yeah, um, we're in Arizona, and we didn't really, um, at least where we are, we didn't really uh, see any effect of that. Maybe just colder weather. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it reminded me of, I lived in, when I lived in Florida, it was 2012, there was a storm like this. And yeah. um, I remember stepping outside at work and going, and looking to the person next to me going, you know, if it's going to be this cold in Florida, it should, it should snow. And, uh, <laughs> 30 right? minutes later it did, it started snowing. And oh the gosh. funny thing was for us, and I'm sure you guys saw this is people in Florida, like the cities aren't made for yeah. snow. So they blocked off the towns like yeah. for our town, our little town, they wow. put barricades in the Northern and Southern, uh, you know, roads, which were the only ways yeah. in and out of the city. And they wouldn't let anybody leave or come in because, there was no infrastructure support around, like there was no yeah. snow plows, there's no salts. Um, but that was us. But the bigger picture was actually Atlanta and Atlanta. It was like a disaster. It was oh so gosh. bad. And I, when I was hearing about Texas, that's the first thing I thought of is like, Oh, this is the next <laughs> Atlanta. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I thought it was so crazy. And like, I was talking with my husband and I'm like, okay, well, this is, can't be the first time like snow happened. And I guess in like the seventies or eighties, they got like San Antonio got about 13 inches of snow. And I'm like, this, this has happened before. (laughs) Like what happened to the pipes then? Um, but yeah, I mean, absolutely kind of just, I don't know. I sent out an email earlier this week to, um, all of our clients and just said like, it literally snowballed into one problem after another. Like, I mean, it was first like the electricity and then the water and then the grocery stores and then the water supply. And it, oh my gosh, I, I'm glad it all didn't happen at once. I felt like there was a nice flow of like one disaster of, an, after another. So we can kind of like pick up the pieces. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, at least for us, I guess so many other people are, we're still trying to bounce back and the grocery stores are still crazy. But um, yeah, it, <laughs> 
happy we're at least up and running. We have Wi-Fi and internet. We can record a podcast. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, they kind of, and you're, you're from uh, California and it, yeah. it reminds me a little bit of like the, um, the fires and like the rolling blackouts. Like, yeah. It's different obviously, but you have like these weeks where you just keep losing power day yeah. after day after day. And, and it's the kind of the same thought process is like, what the heck? Like, come yeah. on, don't, don't we have like fires every year? Like, don't we have hot days every year that like, are we not does, I don't know. It just, right. I mean, I know that yeah. Texas doesn't get snow every year, but the thought is still there. It's kind of like, I don't know. It's just a little wild, yeah. I guess. Well, it, it's weird. Cause I hadn't heard about the, I mean, maybe it didn't affect the, the area that my parents are in. California is such a big state, but, um, I, I didn't hear about the rolling blackouts in California. And so when people were saying, oh, it's like back when California lost power, I was like, we lost power. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's just so interesting kind of, uh, I don't know. You would think, you would think we're more prepared for di disasters. Um, but. Oh well, yeah. Well, that happened to us in the first year we were in Northern California, uh, mm -hmm. 2018. So not too long ago. And okay. we did our first summer and it was like, I want to say like three weeks in a row. Yeah. There was like three days in the week where we were out of like three days in a row for three weeks oh straight my gosh. of no power. And I remember thinking, you know, we run an online company and we worked at the time we were working out of our house. And I remember being like, okay, this is why we bought uh, up systems. Like if you're not familiar, yeah. um, if you go to like a Best Buy or I guess Amazon now and you type in um, ups, which is, what does it stand for? I can't remember. <laughs> Unified power supply or something like that. Yeah. Um, they basically, if you plug them in your wall, then you plug your computer into your up system. And what happens is they store power depending on how big of an up system oh. you buy. So mm -hmm. right cost can be a factor. Um, it can store power for events like that. So if you have, you're in a building or if you're in a state where like Texas, where you're, um, something like that happens and yeah. you've lost power, your up system will run based on the one you bought. So it could run for three hours. It could run for eight hours and you have constant power. So yeah. One of our backup plans that we had was we had uh, hotspots and then ups just in case power went out. At least we still had cellular data that we would connect to our computers and our computers could yeah. run uh, the rest of the day. So either A, it didn't like shut off on us and just yeah. delete whatever we were working on. So we had time to save and shut things down properly. Or we could just finish the workday without yeah. power, uh, <laughs> but we could still finish the workday, be available for, you know, calls or, you know, be, be available to manage the team. And that's just a... Um, Maybe a topic for another day, but sort of having that, <laughs> that backup plan. Yeah. Have a go. What is it? A go. A, what would it be? A go bag for your business? Include you a, yeah. Include like a generator. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was funny. My mom sent me like links to buy, like where I can buy a generator. And I'm like, I don't think it's going to get here in time. And I feel like the opportunity has passed. Like now's we'll just write it out. Um, but yeah, that'd be a good podcast episode. A go bag for your business. Um, go. yeah. Hmm, interesting. Well, today we are not going to be talking about go bags. We'll be talking about Facebook groups. So we have talked a lot about Facebook groups and it's important to first clarify the difference between a Facebook group and a Facebook page. Facebook page is essentially where you can post your business. Um, if you're a celebrity, you can, you know, have a celebrity Facebook page, but it's kind of uh, similar to like a Google page or a Yelp page. It has your, you know, all the information you need, a website, hours, address, you can contact people, you can post updates. A Facebook group is very different in that it is a community of people where people can interact, comment. It's much more engaging than a Facebook page. And we talk a lot about why we prefer Facebook groups over Facebook pages. You can check out one of our prior episodes, why you should ditch Facebook pages for Facebook groups. But in this episode specifically, we're going to go into how to actually build a Facebook group. Maybe you're sold on the idea, you're ready to go, um, and, and it's time to start building. So the first step uh, in building your Facebook group is to choose a title. So when you choose a title, you need to have your audience in mind. You know, very much like your business, you need to think about who you're serving, what is the ultimate purpose of this Facebook group. Now, if you're an accountant or a bookkeeper, we're going to assume that your goal is to get more leads, get more quality clients, um, that sort of thing. So there's a couple ways you can approach this. You can think about 
who you're attracting. So, you know, maybe you want to have a local SEO sort of, uh, sort of stance. So, uh, say you're based out of, I don't know, Oklahoma city and you want to have a Oklahoma city, small business owners. Um, and so that's, you know, that would be the title of your group. Uh, so maybe you don't want to be local. Maybe you have a niche that is, um, female entrepreneurs, you know, female, I'm sure there's tons of those groups, but female entrepreneur Facebook group, try to include some aspect of your target audience in the title. Yeah, that's good. And, you know, I kind of want to take a step back a little bit and talk about uh, some of the changes that we've seen in Facebook. And one of the reasons we keep talking about Facebook groups is because Mm -hmm. back in 2017, if you can remember, they actually changed their algorithm. So if you were scrolling through your Facebook feed, um, and if you were like me, I actually liked what my feed was like, like who I was seeing and whatnot. And then one day it was my entire feed shifted and everything that I used to see was totally gone. And everything I was seeing now was centered around groups. And so Facebook took groups and they elevated it to like the number one thing that you see on your activity feed. Um, So that's just a little bit of, you know, I guess uh, back end knowledge to understand um, what Facebook is doing with their uh, activity feed and who they're putting what activity in front of. Um, The other thing is organic reach. So on Facebook, you used to have a higher percentage of organic reach. So what that means is, if I post a link to my blog post, like my website, it used to be able to reach more people. But what all the social media platforms have done and are continuing to do is they want you to stay on their platform. And so mm-hmm. they want all the users on Facebook to stay on Facebook. Uh, LinkedIn wants all the people on LinkedIn to stay on LinkedIn. So what does that mean? That means if you're posting something that's directing somebody away from Facebook, Facebook's actually going to, for better words, they're going to basically penalize you or they're just not going to yeah. support you. And so having a Facebook group in, is A, top of their algorithm. So Facebook groups are great. But being able to communicate the Facebook group on your activity feed and, and putting conversation within the group is going to help elevate that into your uh, prospective customers' Facebook feeds. Um, and then just one thing to note is that you don't want to leave your entire business on Facebook. So making sure you do have a website and somewhere to direct uh, traffic to is extremely important because once you get people in your group, then it's okay. You still want customers. Like the group isn't the end goal. So make sure that there's still a plan to direct those people to you so you can get clients and get paid. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's actually, that's a really good segue because our next sort of step for you is to brainstorm content. So if you've noticed your Facebook page, it's not sort of getting the results you want because of your content, you know, you're being penalized because you're posting links to a blog post or links to your website. In a Facebook group, you can very much have, you know, a place where your website is or or have built a little bit of a reputation um, and not necessarily get penalized. Facebook is rewarding good conversation in Facebook, in uh, Facebook groups. So when you are brainstorming content, the idea is really to talk about a little bit more than just accounting and tax. You know, that's what you're known for and that's what you want to be hired for. But think about your target audience. Their pain point is accounting and tax subjects. It is unlikely they're going to join a Facebook group around the subject of accounting and tax. So trying to find ways to engage with your clients where you can, you know, maybe add some accounting advice, add some tax advice, establish yourself as a credible source. Um, but they, they need to be able to come to the Facebook group for something other than just uh, wanting to learn more about the tax code. So general sort of business building tips or consulting is a great one. I know a lot of the bookkeepers that I work with, you know, you guys offer bookkeeping services, but then you also have like a consulting plan, um, which gets into a little bit of like finance accounting. Uh, but that's, it's kind of a great way to, uh, to make sure that you have a well-rounded group. Yeah. And that's, and that's pretty smart. Um, in, in something about sort of, uh, the topic of, um, you know, creating a group and not necessarily making it focused on tax. Like you said, um, I'm a small business owner and I'm looking for, I might be looking for help on, you know, how to manage my business better, but I don't necessarily want to read thread after thread after thread of IRS, 
you know, codes yeah. and, and whatnot, right? That's the groups you are a part of <laughs> as the accounting <laughs> provider. You're, you need to be a yeah. part of those groups so that you know what you're talking about. Uh, so the one thing that kind of is, stands out to me the most is when you do something like this, you have to be consistent. And so that is definitely something to think about when you're starting your group is going, okay, is this something that I can consistently pay attention to? Is it something that I can uh, engage in daily or weekly or make sure I'm posting to or make sure I'm, I'm constantly um, updating? Because if you just create it and it just sits there, um, the whole concept of, uh, you know, as long as I build it, people will come, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work no. like that. Um, so for those people who feel like, well, maybe there's just not enough time in my day where I can do that consistently, or maybe like I don't like social media. <laughs> there's pl like I'm kind of like yeah. that. Like there's plenty of people that are like I just don't hang out on social media all day long. It's just not my thing. Then once again, the fallback is then join groups, be a part of business groups that your yeah. customers or maybe not business, but whatever your customers are, be a part of the groups that your clients will are a part of, and just be involved in the conversation. This way, you don't have to be committed to being there every day and every week and always posting something but you're there for when the topic comes up that you are an expert on and that you can speak on and that's i mean and if you're running a group that's also you should be doing that anyways yeah so yeah i mean joining those other groups it's also a good way to sort of brainstorm content you know what are people talking about what's a what's a common issue people are having and even if you're you know as you're an accountant in other accounting groups a common question people ask is, you know, how do I get clients or how do I get sales? That's something you can ask in your own Facebook group. Say, how, you know, how do you, how are you guys getting new clients? What have you tried this week? It's just a good way to kind of generate um, ideas and conversation, but be inspired by the conversations happening in those groups. And, and it's a great place to start to brainstorm content. So you have your title, you have brainstormed some content. The next step is to actually set up your group. Now, as you go through sort of the Facebook process of setting it up, one of the questions they are going to ask is a closed versus open group. We recommend doing a closed group. Now, there's a couple reasons for this. One, uh, you're able to filter your audience. So if you have a very specific niche, let's say restaurants and bars, for example, you can say uh, or you can have one of your questions be, do you own a restaurant or a bar uh, or, you know, provide a link to your restaurant website. From there, you know, you can make sure that only restauranteurs and, and bar owners are entering your Facebook group. So a closed group does that. You can also request they provide you with an email before they join your group. This is really an awesome way to build your email list and get a little bit more return on your investment from having a Facebook group. Um, lastly, you know, a lot of times if you search through your open groups on Facebook, they're kind of used as, um, sometimes used as a sales pitch for random people trying to sell widgets or, you know, their services and you lose some of that quality and the purpose for the group in the first place. Um, so that's why we recommend a closed group. You know, if you want to accept an email, if you don't, if you want to ask filter questions or not, that's up to you. But making sure it's a closed group versus an open actually really increases the quality of, of that group. So now that you have your group all set up, you are going to move into the member questionnaires. And so we touched on, we talked about this a little bit, but this is actually a setting you have to set up in the Facebook group. So like I said, we recommend requesting an email. Even if you are not actively sending out a newsletter, it's really great to just have an email list going. Maybe you aren't using it or you don't have the time or, you know, whatever reason right now, there's going to come a day where you're going to say, okay, I'm ready for more clients. An email list is a great place to start. So ask for the email. Um, you can ask for, you know, do they own the type of business that your target audience is in? You can, you know, tell them to review the terms and conditions of the group, you know, no sales posting or, um, you know, be nice, things like that. Um, but the most important thing I think with the member questionnaire is to know that once you accept or decline the request to join, that information, the questionnaire form disappears. I have no idea why Facebook has this setting or makes the information disappear, but make sure you, if you want their email, write it down before you accept or decline. 
um, otherwise you're not going to be able to get it back. The next step is uh, to grow, grow your Facebook group. And so Eric, you actually use a really good uh, example um, frequently in marketing, you know, that marketing is an investment very much like working out. Uh, you work out day one, you're not going to have like great calves or something. You have to keep putting in a little bit of time every single day. Um, and you know, eventually in maybe a couple months, you will start to see results. Um, and it'll take like, maybe a year or even more before you get the actual results that you want. Uh, so that's what you have to keep in mind when it comes to Facebook group growth is it's going to take some time. Yeah. And that's a good example, uh, because I can build off that. Uh, if you think about the concept of exercising, um, let's imagine that you know, you're at your house and you're going, okay, um, I got to start exercising. And, mm -hmm. but I, you know, maybe I, have a, I don't really have a budget for whatever, a gym membership and shoes and equipment or what have you. So you start off kind of the, the freeway. You know, you're, I'll, go, I'll wake up in the morning, I'll go for a run, and I'll do some push-ups and whatever. And that's, that's good. But in all honesty for like, if you want to really get into exercise and like, let's say you want to do like some kind of, I don't know, Ironman competition, or you want to do a mud runner, or you want to do a powerlifting competition, like you need, um, to invest more into that, into your, the way you exercise. And so I would compare that to like, you know, if I actually want to put more attention onto this and be more focused and I'm going to go pay for a gym membership, right? You know, it might be 20 bucks, 50 bucks a month, whatever. But that investment is going to give me access to all the tools, uh, equipment that I need to really uh, level up my my physique, you know, however mm -hmm. you want to put it. Same thing with Facebook and other social media platforms. Doing the groups and, you know, doing what you're doing and trying to get that organic reach for free is great. And the consistency and the long term effect of that is is where like that's a long term game and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you are at a point where you're like, I don't want to wait five years right, for like that organic growth to happen, then, and this is what social media platforms do, they will reward you for investing in their platform, which means push some Facebook ads out there, put a little money into Facebook ads to promote your group and to promote your business. And that's kind of similar to putting some money in to monthly to get a gym membership. And maybe you bought some gym clothes and maybe you bought, I don't know, pre-workout and some protein. I don't know, whatever yeah. the thing is, right? Yeah. It's the kind of the same concept. Like, and, and the social media platforms aren't stupid. So in the background, they're going, if someone's paying me, I want them to succeed, right? That's yeah. what Facebook is doing. They're not necessarily the bad guy. They're just going, you pay me, I want you to succeed because I'm making money off of you. And how can I make more money off of you if you continue to succeed? And so it's a two-way street. And I think a lot of us sometimes go, well, how can I just get the most bang for my buck? You know, how can I get the most for nothing? Or what can mm -hmm. I do for free? And I like to caution people on that. And it goes, you know, the, the, the mindset is like, if you're not willing to pay, I mean, a lot of times I like to, when I'm talking with a business owner and I go, look, there's going to be a point where you as a business owner need to pay for things. Like if you want to mature and grow and really reach those dreams you're trying to reach, like pay your professional service providers, pay the things you need to pay for, just like you expect your clients to pay you. Like, doesn't it frustrate you that you have clients who go, oh, you, you want to do my tax return for $400, but I only want to spend $50. So I'm going to go to TurboTax yeah. and they screw it up. And then it makes you mad, right? Same thing. You, you, this time mm -hmm. you're on the other end going, well, I don't want to pay for Facebook ads because I can just do it for free. And it's like, just put some money into it, put some investment yeah. into it and like move on. Right. And keep yeah. on your business. Yeah. Yeah. And this, I mean, this is that investment. Um, and, and there's plenty of ways that you can kind of spend money or there's even a few kind of tricks we have on how to grow your group for free. Um, but a great place that we like to start is to actually go to your Facebook page. So a bunch of people have probably liked your Facebook page. I invite you to go to the member section and message each person and say something along the lines of, hey, thanks so much for liking our page. We have started a Facebook group. I thought you may be interested. Now, these are people that have actively said they like your business, they like what you're doing. They very well may be interested in your Facebook group because they wanna learn more. They wanna learn more about your business and because of the Facebook algorithm, they probably haven't seen too many of your posts. So they're likely interested in your content. It's a great way to kind of grow your group, 
get a little bit of a foundation going um, and starting to uh, generate some buzz. Another great way to grow your group is to create a webinar or a course within the group. So Facebook groups actually is really set up very well for this. There are different ways that you can kind of add um, live videos or course instructions. Um, there's like units and subunits and all, all these kind of different ways that you can kind of create a course within that group. And we're not going to go into too much detail right now. Um, but basically how you can start this is put out an advertisement or a social media post, wherever, and, and say that you're doing a webinar. In order to view the webinar, it is going to be live within this group. In order to join the group, they have to, you know, apply and invite and go into the group. So, you know, you'll have a webinar for a certain day. It's a great way to generate emails um, and also host a webinar that you can do for free. You don't have to use Zoom or Crowdcast or any other sort of um, software. So once you kind of have, you know, maybe one of those boosters with a webinar or a course, you can also advertise your group on your different sort of outlets. So social media, email campaigns, your website. If you go to our website, proadvisor-marketing.com, uh, you'll notice at the top we have an announcement bar where it says, hey, you know, if you're an accountant or a bookkeeper, you would, we'd love to continue the conversation over in our Facebook group. Um, and so if you have Squarespace, that's a free sort of tool that you can add on. And we've gotten a lot of ju uh, buzz just through having that link and constantly making sure people know, um, know that we're there. So that is all the time that we have for today. I'm going to wrap up with our three to do's. Number one, set up your Facebook group. Number two, invite your target audience to join the group. And number three, strategize three ways that you are going to advertise your group, whether that's a website, email campaign, or webinar. So that's all we have for you today, and we'll see you next time. See ya. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our podcast. If you're getting value from us, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you are listening from. Also, feel free to share with your friends and follow us at facebook.com slash proadvisormarketingus. Now get out there and build your story, tell your story, and sell your story. See you next week.